Performing Arts Presenters, President and CEO, Mario Garcia Durham. Good. Hello. Is this working? Great. Good morning, everyone. How are you all doing? Excellent. That, that's the spirit we want you to take with you back to your jobs and your communities. So welcome to this special moment when we come together to reflect a bit on all that has been accomplished over the past days and to bid each other great success and well wishes for a successful new year. Once again, I want to thank or take this opportunity to thank all of our sponsors, our more than 100 volunteers, and ho us, hopefully uh, you had a chance to thank all of the students. They are a terrific team. They're wearing the, the, the t-shirts. Yeah, let's give applause to those students. Like, like, so. they, were just, they were just amazing. Um, also, the production crew behind the scenes that have made this conference such a success. And um, I especially want to call out the members of the conference committee. Scott Stoner leads this effort, but we cannot do this and all the programs that you saw without an outstanding conference committee. So can I please have a round of applause for our amazing conference committee for this. <laughs> but the leaders of the conference committee, our co-chairs, were on the phone almost daily with Scott, if not weekly, constantly going back and forth about ideas, directions. It was just, they were so, so engaged, I have to say. So uh, uh, Rachel Cohen, Kathy Edwards, and Daniel Bernard Romain, can you please stand and accept our thanks for your work. I now uh, want to take a moment, and you all, um, are involved in organizations and, and, and lead organizations um, and know how important uh, your staff and team is. Um, you know, I'm just kind of pushed out and told where to go and what to do during the conference, and I can't do any of this without this incredible team of, of staff and uh, conference uh, members. So I'm going to you will indulge me, I'm going to take just a moment because I think it's important for everyone to hear their name to know the acknowledgement. So please hold your applause to the end. But um, Megan Redmond, uh, Judy Moore, Tiffany Gauthier, Mallory Baum, Sue Noseworthy, Keisha Shorter, Shruti Makund, Scott Stoner, Kaylin Saylor, Danielle Rohar, Jenny Thomas, Sarah Martin, Melinda Lambert, Nicola Turner, Taylor Rambo, Margaret Stevens, uh, Katina Lancaster, uh, Adam and Christy Kissick, um, um, Mara Zuckerman. Oh, I'm sorry. Hang on, I'm going to come back to that. Uh, the HowlRound team. I uh, want to thank Bill Seaman, um, Robert Baird, who helps us so wonderfully, uh, Bill Carlton, Caitlin Davis, uh, Alicia Anstead, our editor of the Inside Arts magazine, Suzanne Roche, um, and uh, our media relations team, Carol Miller and Nancy Rutherford. And um, I also want to thank our signers, Mara Zuckerman and Z Jane Adler. So can I please have a special round of applause? And please stand up, all of the staff members. Please, 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 please. <laughs> you guys are amazing. But I wanted to just uh, highlight uh, three special mentions. Uh, one, uh, is Marty in the room? Marty, are you in the room? Uh, I don't know if Marty Wallison is in the room. He's, he's on our board. And Marty contacted me a couple of months ago. Um, uh, for those of you who did not know, we um, I had to change management of the conference in October. Um, and so board was terrific as usual. And Marty Wallison, Clarice, Clarice Smith Center in our, in our area down near Washington, uh, volunteered if you can imagine, one of his staff members who is who is in our technical team, and his name is Mark Lanks. So Mark, if you're here, thank you. And then Marty, please convey thanks to Marty. Mark has been here on Marty on Marty's dime the entire conference, working his you know what off for us on the tech team. So thank you, uh, Mark and Marty.
as, as I mentioned, uh, in, in October, I had to make a, a, a change at the very top of, the, of our um, conference team um, with changing conference directors. And something happened <coughs> that is uh, fortunate to us all, and that is that I uh, was referred to an amazing, amazing woman who many of you know, um, who came in, and I can honestly tell you is one of the most professional, unflappable goddesses I've ever worked with, and her name is Victoria Abrash. And can you please give her a huge round of applause there, Victoria? And then finally, you've seen him running around, blonde-haired, uh, Craig, I don't know if Craig's right here. That's my other half, he's, he's a voluntold here. Uh, so please give him a round of applause. He works and works and works. <laughs> All right, so staff, did I have any glaring uh, misses here? Okay, very good. You know how that is with names, always. So great. So um, um, each year we work with the conference committee to um, identify a speaker who will deliver a high level of enthusiasm and inspiration to culminate a successful conference. And those, that have been, those of you that have been attending these, we've been so fortunate to have such amazing speakers here at this final uh, talk. This year will be no exception because, because we have with us a stunning and multi-award winning artist. Multi, meaning she has won all four annual major entertainment awards, an Oscar, an Emmy, a Grammy, and a Tony Award. Uh, she was in D.C. last month. Yes, that's amazing. Uh, she was in D.C. last month to receive a, receive a Kennedy Center's Honors Award for Lifelong Achievement in the Arts. All of these, in addition to receiving the Presidential Medal of Freedom from President Bush and the National Medal of Arts from President Obama. Those are some major kudos. Um, I am, of course, referring to Rita Moreno. Over the past four days, we have learned much about what it means to be a maker. Scott carries this theme forward. It's in front of you all times, and he is passionate about it. Uh, and so she embodies that. Uh, and we have learned that the art of making is not simply something one is born with. Rita Moreno has exemplified what it takes to have an incredibly successful career by always standing up for one's principles and embracing rather than running from obstacles that may lie in the way. She makes us proud as a member of the arts community. She makes a difference as a champion for equality and social justice, a theme that ran throughout the entire conference, especially on this weekend. And these are principles that we have celebrated strongly. Ultimately, she makes us wonder, how can anyone, after decades of accomplishing dream after dream, still be as busy as ever? And she just told me before we came on that this Saturday she has a performance at Lincoln Center, the American Songbook, which should be fantastic. Unfortunately, it's sold out. <laughs> but try to get a ticket if you can. <laughs> anyway, ladies and gentlemen, again, as happens in this conference, these are individuals that I never in my wildest dreams thought I would meet, much less introduce. So please, a huge round of applause for the amazing Rita Moreno. Wow. Thank you. Woo, wow. My goodness gracious. My goodness, I'm so delighted you're here. I am so delighted to be with you today. Uh, actually, I'm thrilled to be anywhere that's not outside today. <laughs> Can you believe it? We Puerto Rican girls do not do well in this kind of weather. So anyway, yesterday some of us uh, celebrated and remembered with profound gratefulness, the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. Octavio Paz, the great Mexican poet and diplomat, said, what sets worlds in motion is the interplay of differences, their attractions and repulsions. Death is uniformity, life 
is plurality. August 28, 1963 was a boiling hot day in Mount Washington, D.C. I sat not more than 15 feet away from Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. And as he rose to address that massive, that sea of over a quarter of a million souls assembled at the base of the Lincoln Memorial, stretching on both sides of the reflecting pool and all the way to the Washington Monument. And as he stood to speak, <coughs> excuse me, I heard, I was there, I heard Mahalia Jackson, the great gospel singer, who was a good friend of Dr. King's, call out to him. She said, Martin, tell them about the dream. Tell them about the dream, Martin. And that's when he changed his talk. Isn't that amazing? I was 32 years old. Less than a year later, during his acceptance of the Nobel Peace Prize, he said, he said, I refuse to accept the view that mankind is so tragically bound to the starless midnight of racism and war that the bright daybreak of peace and brotherhood can never become a reality. And then is the New York Times story that I read yesterday. Spike Lee and Jada Pinkett Smith won't attend the Oscars. Why? Well, you can find the answer on the editorial page of the New York Times. And the Oscar goes to white people. So, I was 32 in 1963, I am now 84. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, it's nothing. By my math, that's 52 years ago, more than half a century, and yet the struggle continues. Sometimes, you know, sometimes you have absolutely no idea. This is on another subject, by the way. It's a terrible uh, segue. <laughs> sometimes you have absolutely no idea who's watching or listening to you, and you certainly have no clue how life can affect them. You may know that I received the Kennedy Center Honors Award in December, and let me tell you, I was so surprised and delighted when Gina Rodriguez, my TV granddaughter on Jane the Virgin, appeared on stage and said, in paying tribute to me, among other things, she said to me, you gave me hope. You gave me a reason to fight and to speak up. You gave me a voice, and how can I ever thank you? I'm not sure how, but I can tell you this. When you followed your dreams, Rita, you gave me the allowance to follow more. Naturally, <laughs> her words left me undone. So, you might ask, how does a little girl from Juncos, Puerto Rico, who danced for her grandpa, oh, one Puerto Rican in the whole joint. <laughs> so how does a little girl from Puerto Rico, Juncos, Puerto Rico, who danced for her grandpa in his tiny casita, where he rolled cigars out to eke out a living, how does this person become a well-known American actress whose story would inspire others, you know? Who would have thunk? In 1936, when I was five years old, my 22-year-old mother set sail with me for the United States, me, her little girl, Rosita Dolores Alverio, on the SS Carabobo. That name literally translated means the SS Stupid Face. <laughs> Bobo, stupid. Gotta face. A ship with like that, with a name like that, is not a good omen. 
She was leaving behind an unhappy marriage and the stinging poverty that was prevalent on the island at the time. She filled a trunk and tore two poor people's suitcases, also known as shopping bags, then took my hand and we climbed the gangway to begin a brand new life in America. However, sometimes God's plans are very different from ours. A few hours later, we were met by a violent storm, a storm that threw everyone into a collective state of panic. Now, <clears throat> Latino people have many natural talents, but one area in which we particularly excel is panicking. <laughs> when it comes to panicking, we are the envy of the world. It is part of our worldview. We are profoundly passionate people, pathologically passionate people. Everything in excess, nothing in moderation. Where other cultures believe in restraint and self-control, we believe in the principle of constant combustibility. <laughs> when in doubt, flip out. <laughs> Not kidding. The storm raged for what seemed like an eternity, and thankfully, we finally found safe haven in New York Harbor. And that's when I first saw this enormous green lady shooting right up out of the water, wearing some sort of crown on her head, holding what looked like a uh, huge flaming ice cream cone. <laughs> oh, mommy, ¿quién es esa señora tan grande? <laughs> My mom tells me that that señora is a very special señora, that she's inviting everyone from around the world to come to America to come and live here, to come and be citizens of Los Estados Unidos, especialmente people who are pobres, cansados, hambrientos, sin hogar, poor, tired, hungry, and homeless. We are definitely overqualified. <laughs> but when I look up at that big green lady's face, all I can think is, oh my goodness. That lady runs this country. <laughs> and look where we are right now. When we get to New York, we make a beeline for the Bronx where we proceed to move into a four bedroom apartment. The only problem is that there are three other families living there as well. The hallways are dimly lit. They are dimly lit, like the light bulbs are just so dim some missing from their sockets. The walls have been painted so long ago that they turned into a shade of kind of mustard, the color of all tenement apartments. The good news is that we don't stay there in the four bedroom apartment for very long. The bad news is that our next apartment has only one room. I sleep in a tiny iron bed with my mommy. The place is so small even the cockroaches can't move around. And these are New York cockroaches. I mean, you turn on the light, instead of scattering, scattering, they're all standing up straight and saying, so, que quieres tu, turn off the light. <laughs> yes, they do put their little legs on their little legs. <laughs> That's a New York cockroach for you. They don't do that in LA. We had to keep moving. When you're that broke, you move just to get the rent concession. Most of the time, you just move across the street. This is true. And then a little while later, you move back again. It's sort of like a poor people's version of alternate side of the street parking. <laughs> but at least the new apartment would always be freshly painted and the walls weren't flaking at that moment. When I started exploring the outside, it was to go to a big scary place called school, where millions of other kids knew everything I didn't know and absolutely nobody spoke Spanish because this was before the Puerto Rican diaspora. The only way my mom could get me to go to, was to drop me off and tell me she was going to buy me a packet of chicle gum. And I'd be right back, okay? <laughs> I cried and I thought she'd left me forever. Once I settled into this new routine, I felt safe in my classroom, but walking home 
That was a different story because I ran home. I ran home from school almost every day. I got a lot of exercise because I never ran in a straight line. I had to crisscross the street every half block to avoid the gangs of kids who owned the sidewalks. I couldn't get to our apartment building soon enough, let me tell you. I crisscrossed from side to side to try to escape the jeers and name calling. Spake, garlic mouth, pierced ear, grease ball, names I had never heard until we arrived in this cold, gray, grit, frozen hell in the dead of winter. I was actually amazed to see that the trees had no leaves. I had never seen trees with no leaves before. It was like, it was so unlike the tranquil, idyllic, fragrant paradise where I was born. And oh boy, how I longed for my homeland, my island, and Grandpa Justino. The pain of those terrible words would stay with me throughout my childhood right into my adult life. I'd run from the feelings caused by those words. I must have believed them because I, I, had, I, I had to must believe them because later I would run from myself, Rosita Dolores Alverio, the niña who just didn't fit, whose skin was too dark, whose hair was too curly. What was it? Did I carry the smell of my abuelo's cigars? Oh boy, I really wanted to be somebody. The problem is I wanted to be somebody else. So what do you do when reality bites? You dream. My sanctuary was beside our cathedral-shaped table radio that sat by the window in our barrio apartment. When the weather was friendly, mommy would let me go out that window under the fire escape and I would spread my blanket like a magic carpet on those steel rungs. I would lie there and look up at the sky and the stars, and I would listen to all of my favorite singers and bands, Miguelito Valdez, Celia Cruz, Frank Sinatra. These were my Shakira, my Ricky Martin, my Maroon 5, my Pharrell Williams. And when I closed my eyes, <coughs> I could go anywhere. I could be anybody. And I would sing along with my favorite group. My favorite group was the Pied Pipers. And I was saying, dream when you're feeling blue. Dream, that's the thing to do. Dream, watch the smoke rings rise in the find your share of memories there. So dream when the day is through. Dream and they might come through. sad as they sing, so dream, dream, dream. Thank you. Wow. Thank you. And I earnestly hope that phone was turned off. Because if I hear it again, you die. <laughs> I know, we tend to make big threats like that, right? Don't really mean it. Most of the time. My greatest longing, my dream, was to be in show business. And my mom allowed me to pursue it, like many immigrant mothers before and many who would follow. She spent much of her time just getting by, 
all the while encouraging me to pursue my dreams and reach for the stars, and I did. For years, I mistakenly thought I had no role model. But oh boy, it wasn't until much later that I would appreciate my mom's example of hard work, persistence, and a spirit that would not surrender. Somehow those values became deeply embedded in my character and motivated me throughout my life and career to never give in, never quit. I look back and see her as a hero. And of course, like all heroes, she had feet of clay. Oh my God, how she could embarrass me. <laughs> Once, well, she had a little trouble with the English language. So uh, once when I had a little girlfriend over to play, she said, okay, girls, it's too hot. She said, <laughs> yes, I remember. She started to fan herself, walk up and down the apartment, said, listen, girls, I, I defy you to try to do this accent. <laughs> Good luck. Listen, girls, girls. She said, it's too hot to do any work today for piss sake. <laughs> you said it? You said piss? <laughs> she said, so I'll tell you what we are going to do. We're going to pack a picnic lunch and have a nice swing at the beach. You can imagine how mortified I was. Oh my God. And you know, in other times she said uh, to me, she said, Rosita, it's Saturday. Once a month, you know, it's time to change the shits. <laughs> and I was I just so mortified. I said, Mommy, Mommy, for God's sake, bendito sea Dios, Mommy. Te la ruego. I said, why, mommy? And she said, because I got trouble with my bowels. <laughs> yes, she did. And yet, my precious, wonderful, sweet, and tender mommy understood my passion and genuinely sacrificed for my, my benefit. She would take me for dance lessons, then travel with me so I could perform at any bar mitzvah or wedding reception that would book me for the entertainment. In those early years, I was a miniature Carmen Miranda, the Brazilian samba singer, some of you may remember. My mommy, a sweatshop worker, handmade my costumes and fashioned me a fruit salad headdress just like Carmen Miranda's. Sometimes I would get an after-school job at Macy's Little Theater, situated in the toy department in New York City. We would entertain the kids and their parents with songs. Anyway, a few years later, I was performing at a dance school recital when a talent scout was so pleased with my performance, can you believe it, that he whispered my name into the ear of the great Mr. Louis B. Mayer, as in Metro Goldwyn Mayer, the studio that made The Wizard of Oz. The scout arranged for Mommy and me to meet this giant of film industry. And the only way I thought I might make an impression on the great man was to try to look like my idol, Elizabeth Taylor. And once again, Mommy was there to help. We bought a waist cincher and invested in a set of feminine enhancements. <laughs> <clears throat> my dress, my hair, my nails, my shoes, my face, my gloves, every single last inch of me was prepped and powdered and covered and uncovered until at last the time for the unveiling had come. We rode the elevator up and up to the highest turret in the Waldorf Astoria. And when the doors finally opened, there he was, the little wizard himself, all five foot four of him. <laughs> Just like the little man behind the curtain in The Wizard of Oz, my eyes were like this. He took my hand and held it and gave me a quick once over. The inspection took all of 30 seconds before he said, why, 
She looks like a Spanish Elizabeth Taylor. <laughs> How does a seven-year contract sound to you, young lady? Well, my feet just lifted off the floor as I flew around the room. I was 16 years old, 16. Six months later, I was on the MGM lot in Culver City, California. Well, MGM was the most amazing place in the world with a constellation of all the greatest stars in the Hollywood heavens. They were everywhere. I remember being in the studio cafe for lunch, overwhelmed and occupied with all the choices of exotic foods on the steam table like roast beef and gravy, <laughs> mashed potatoes, Boston cream pie. Listen, I was brought up on black beans and rice. And then, as if that wasn't enough, they sauntered in like real people. Clark Gable, Lana Turner, Ricardo Montalban, and oh my God, Elizabeth Taylor! <laughs> I wet my knickers. <laughs> so for the first three years, the studio, unhappily, cast me to play every kind of ethnic role you can imagine. Polynesian girl, Indian princess, Arabian girl, or any dark-skinned girl they needed. I hated those parts. I now refer to them as my dusky maiden roles. I had to deliver lines to my white lover like, why you no love Ula no more? And then my character, Ula, the Indian maiden, is so distraught when he summarily, white person, of course, summarily rejects her that she flings herself off a cliff. And you know, when I was thinking of this story to tell you, my long-term memory kicked in as I was recalling this story. And I remembered that at the end of that scene, the director cut to the waves lapping over Ula's lifeless body on the beach at the bottom of the cliff which of course in reality was me. And in that water, this was filmed in Mexico, were hundreds, thousands of tiny jellyfish stinging me. So of course, this dead person is wiggling with discomfort. <laughs> the director barks to me, stop twitching, God damn it! you're supposed to be dead. But, but Mr. Allen, I'm, I'm, I'm getting stung by these jellyfish. Shut up and do as I say. And there you have it. He sees me not as Rita Moreno, young actress. He sees me as Ula. So you have to ask yourself, what was in the mind of these studio executives and writers? The parts they were creating for young minority actresses gave a clue. These roles objectified us. They almost always portrayed us as ignorant, uneducated, totally passive, unable to read and write, and morally bankrupt, usually some white man's mistress. So, you ask, how does an Indian princess speak? Or an Arabian girl, for that matter? So I think, what can I do to make these terrible parts at least more authentic? We were given no dialogue coaches, and the directors never seemed to care, so I decided to solve the problem myself. I gave accents to these characters as I thought they should have. Well, a while back, I found a couple of my old movie clips on YouTube and started laughing out loud. <laughs> the, accent I the accents I created all sounded the same. If she was Arabian, she sounded like this. If she was Indian, she sounded like this. <laughs> Hawaiian, she sounded like this. I had created a universal ethnic accent. <laughs> so, why did you take these parts, I'm asked. It's called paying the rent. In real life, most of us have periods when our careers are not satisfying, but I could never give up. If I wasn't being cast in the best roles on the best projects, I could at least dream. And I did. For inspiration, I'd visit the sound stages where these kind of movies were being made at Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer. I love visiting the movie sets. Any set 
And every one of these sets was like a little village with its own cast of characters. Directors and designers, gaffers, grips, hundreds of people all working together under the mantle of a great star. The Humphrey Bogart set, the Judy Garland set, and there I was in 1952 on the Gene Kelly set. Mr. Gene Kelly had taken a chance on me and cast me in the non-ethnic role of Zelda Zanders in Singing in the Rain. What an experience to work with Gene Kelly and to be given a non-ethnic mark. I even had to wear a red wig. All right, I thought, this is the beginning of a new career. And by the way, it's such a great movie. Go see it again. I was so young, you won't recognize me. But I was Zelda Zander, and I had a red wig. I mean, every time I look at it, I think, oh, God, not one wrinkle. Oh. <laughs> now, every profession has telltale signs of failure, signals from your employers that your talents may no longer be required. In the acting business, what happens is very simple. Your phone goes dead. So when the phone stopped ringing three years into my MGM contract, I was filled with dread. A whole six months went by without being in a movie. I was finally called into the casting office and told, listen, dear, you know you're in trouble when they call you, dear. We're letting you go. Just like that. Well, I cried for two, for two months, never in front of my mother. How could I? It took both of us to care for my baby brother and us. If I don't contribute, we don't eat. I considered every employment possibility, even secretarial school, but my internal compass kept pointing to that dream. So I took any job I could get. Movies like The Fabulous Senorita, Cattle Town, Fort Vengeance, Ma and Pa Kettle on Vacation, that was a low. <laughs> Latin Lovers, The Yellow Tomahawk, Seven Cities of Gold, of Ula fame. So you see, some careers can start off slow and then go downhill from there. <laughs> the studio controlled my life. <clears throat> In many ways, even my social life. The studio executives would use big movie magazine spreads to test which one of their contract players might catch the public eye. The, the, these uh, movie magazines are now sort of like People magazine. So they sent you out with someone you hardly knew, a guy, uh, and f staged fake dates. Two pieces of hot young Hollywood eye candy decked to the nines, pretending to be as happy as uneaten clams, with a photographer and a writer in tow to chronicle every move you made on that date. Here we are, driving in the star-spangled Buick. Here we are, dining at the Rainbow Grill, here we are, dancing at the oh-so-hot Macambo. <laughs> and as boring as they were, these fake dates were better than the alternative. One afternoon, I was sent off to a cocktail party on the arm of a man named Harry Carl, the famous shoe tycoon and lover of all things young and beautiful, which he most definitely was not. Well, with a meets minutes, of meeting Mr. Carl inside the vast confines of his bright yellow Cadillac convertible, it's clear that he and I don't even have the weather in common. And by the time we enter the home of Alfred Hart, the famous whiskey tycoon, and the butler took my rap, I realize that I've been abandoned. Harry Carl went somewhere in that house. So, left to swim in a sea of powerfully rich men, who are looking for any poor woman willing to uh, show some gratitude. The head of Columbia Pictures, Harry Cohn, comes over to where I'm sitting and says, and I am quoting him, and by the way, I looked adorable. I borrowed a beautiful little cocktail dress from the costume department. And he approaches me and says to me, I want to fuck you. I had maybe heard that word twice in my life. I was a very young, 17, 18. I try to laugh, and when I move to get away, another man grabs me from behind. This is a cocktail party. 
Seeing my distress, the host of the party comes over and pulls me onto the dance floor. Yes, his living room had a dance floor and a band. But now he's squeezing me tighter and tighter. And then he begins to breathe heavily. And a little beads of sweat begin to form on his upper lip. And he's whispering, you're a sexy little bitch, aren't you? I bet you're wild in bed. I try to pull away, but he pulls me back up hard against his body and moves against me, ostensibly dancing with me. And I just say, please, please, Mr. Hart. And he says, don't play that game with me, baby. And I finally pull away really hard. I'm going to throw up. I'm, I am throwing up. I go to the bathroom and say to myself, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? Finally, somebody knocks on the door. Mascara is running. I run out of the bathroom. I forget about my rap, and I run out of the house. And I stumble right onto the Mexican gardeners. And I see them, and they see me. They don't know my name. They don't know who I am, but they completely see me. They place a jacket over my shoulder and carefully fold me into the front seat of their pickup truck, and they take me home. I don't go to another party for years. One day in 1955, I received a call from my agent, Bullets Durgum. Yes, that was his name. He was very short, and he had a bullet head which is why they called him Bullets. <laughs> hey, Rita, Reader, he used to call me Reader. <laughs> Listen, honey, they're doing tests for the king and I, and they want you to come in and try out. Yeah, the stage version was great, but man, this is gonna be, this is gonna be really fabulous. Well, it was yet one more ethnic part, but oh, what a movie. I loved the king and I, and Bullets was right. It was an instant classic. For the next five years, it was more of the same. I kept playing these ethnic parts, always hoping for something better. It was 1954. I was all of 23 years old when I, my entire universe became defined by the figure of an older man. I was visiting the set of the film Desiree at 20th Century Fox, where I was under contract when I coincidentally stuck my head into the makeup room, and there he was, Marlon Brando. Well, in that single moment, I learned that the eyes are windows to more than just the soul. I'm telling you, that room became so hot, <laughs> the walls began to sweat. <laughs> I was gone head over heels, heels over head. Have you ever been so obsessed with someone that you feel like you can't breathe without them? Mar have you? Well, Marlon felt that way about himself. <laughs> Unhappily, I agreed with him. <laughs> you know that phrase, I thought I would die? When he walked into a room, I'm telling you, I could feel the pores of my skin expanding. And when he left the room, my hands would actually turn cold. I was in a fever for eight years. It's in the book, by the way. <laughs> which I'm going to sign after this. I was a happy prisoner of my own desire to please him, to impress him, to fill myself with him. Marlon, though, wasn't even at that stage. Fascinating man, outrageously funny, impossibly charming, with a voracious intelligence that could, th could devour the world. But personal development in a romantic relationship, he never believed in it. He believed in Marlon Brando, not the person, 
the persona. Well, I was gobsmacked, head over heels in love with him, along with at least two other women at that time. I had no idea, of course. Apparently, I was not enough for him. He required a harem. <laughs> well, <clears throat> a girl does have to have a little ammo in her arsenal. I got a call at about the time when I had discovered some ladies' clothing in his, uh, in his bedroom. And I got a call from a man named, Hello, Miss Marina. This is uh, Colonel Parker. Ah, our manager, Elvis Presley. Uh, Elvis uh, would like very much to meet you. Would you like to meet him? <laughs> and I thought of that clothing. And I said, yes, I would. <laughs> I would like to meet Elvis. What was he like? Well, you can find out more in the book, but I can tell you this. No, 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 I can tell you this. He was no hound dog. <laughs> At the time we were seeing each other, Marlon made a very telling observation about my personality. He said, you know, you're the most ridiculously optimistic person I have ever met. I have an image of you carrying a stick with a nail at the end like a park attendant, but instead of picking up trash, you pick up bits of hope and deposit them into your little brown paper bag. <laughs> and it still makes me smile because it's absolutely true. Hope is an essential part of my DNA. I am a prisoner of hope. When I was 28, I was offered the part of Anita in West Side Story. Oh, yeah. I loved Anita. She was real, she was Puerto Rican, she fought for her rights, she had plenty to say about stereotypes. And at this point, I had never, ever been given the opportunity to play the role of a woman who stood up for herself, so that Anita's suffering, her anger were my suffering and my anger. Even while we were filming West Side Story, all of the sharks, our gang, were required to slather on very dark makeup. The same shade, every one of us. And I took umbrage with my makeup man about this universal shade we were all being painted. And I argued, I said, listen, Puerto Ricans come in all varied shades of the human rainbow. We are Spanish, we are French, Dutch, Taino, Indian, and black. And he said, oh, do you have a problem being Puerto Rican? And I said, yes, I do have a problem being your kind of Puerto Rican. Just wear the damn makeup, he said. Becoming Anita turned into a personal mission for me. I had fled down those mean streets in fear of the gangs. I had been chased and haunted by that awful word, spick. And Anita and West Side Story would alter my trajectory and help change my life and career forever. There were less glorious projects to follow, some important, most not. But playing Anita fundamentally changed my outlook. I could actually be a person of strength and character. I could choose what was best for me, for my career. I even discovered I could make a difference, which is why I found myself sitting no less than 15 feet from Martin Luther King Jr., as I told you looking beyond myself and engaging my energies in a wider range of interests, I began to see myself as part of the bigger picture, as someone who was now a public figure. I felt a responsibility to help others, and to this day I find service an important discipline. I finally, I'll tell you how I met my husband. I have to make it quick because uh, I'm running out of time. Uh, a friend said, you've got to meet Lenny, he's a wonderful guy. <laughs> he's a nice Jewish doctor. And I said, isn't that redundant? <laughs> anyway, I finally met him, and I, I would love to tell you more about how it happened, but it was, uh, it's, it's, my time is almost out. So, I know. 
it is a wonderful story. <laughs> but I got this, and uh, I really need, I, I think I need to pay attention because there's so many other things going on today. <laughs> I can go on? Okay, so. <laughs> So, okay, so I met my husband, and I married him. And, uh, and then there was the, the Jewish family. And uh, first of all, you can imagine how both thrilled both families were. <laughs> Talk about Romeo and Juliet, so the Capulets. So the Puerto Rican side of the family is saying, ay, 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 bendito. The Jewish side of the family is saying, ay, 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 ay. <laughs> The Bronx was a flame. <laughs> so I finally said to my mom, Mommy, why don't you meet Lenny? He's really a great guy, and I think you're going to like him very much. And she, I said, we need to make peace. This is silly. And she said, you are so right. She said, OK, let's, have, let's make peace. <laughs> she did. <laughs> well, she's still alive. Anyway, uh, Lenny came to my house, rang the doorbell. My mother opened the door. She takes one look at him and she says, Jew, are a you? <laughs> and he says, What? Are you a you? <laughs> the poor man was so flummoxed. He said, yes, I am. Okay, I am. <laughs> anyway, we were married 46 years. It worked. <laughs> OK, it is a long story. I'm not 84 for nothing. So you know, I'm going to fast forward to, to act two, which is 60 years old. Besides, it's almost time for my nap. It had been a decade since I, my last movie, at this point, 1960. The Four Seasons with Alan Alda and Carol Burnett, that was in 1981. Ten years of no movies is a lifetime for an actor. So I was delighted when my agent sent me to try out for a role in a movie that was being cast by a famous director. I worked so hard on that part, I killed myself. I wanted that part so badly, and it wasn't the money, that would be nice but I needed it for my own self-respect. So I sweated over that script for weeks, every word, every nuance, making sure that I had a great handle on the material. By the time of the audition, I actually felt so confident that I knew for certain that they would have to give me that job. I bounced into the room, and there sat Mr. Major Director, surrounded by his minions, and I said, I can't wait to do this scene for you, because I think I really get it. And he glanced down at my script, and an awkward silence fell over the room. Oh, oh, no, no, dear, no. That's, that's not the role I want you to read for. We called you in for the part of the Mexican whorehouse, madam. My agent had given me the wrong part to read. The whore house, madam. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Oscar, Tony, Grammy, Emmy one, Emmy two. This being, this being had brought me into audition, audition, try out, for a role with two lines of dialogue in Spanish. My face is aflame with humiliation. I feel stripped of every ounce of dignity. My life is unraveling and falling down in pieces around my feet. I am diminished. Suddenly, I'm that little six-year-old girl crisscrossing those streets. I'm the girl at the cocktail party. I'm Rosita. What do I say to this classless piece of insensitivity? And then it happened. I made eye contact with him and mustered up all of my dignity. I must have grown four feet. 
mustered up some part of, some, from, some part of me that I had too often willfully forgotten, and I said, from my lofty perch, I'm sorry, but I don't do whorehouse madams. Oh, no, no, darling, you don't understand. No, no, no. You don't understand. And I slowly, very deliberately, slowly picked up my coat, put it across my arm and my shoulder bag, and very slowly walked out of the room. Oh, that sounds so good, doesn't it? The grand theatrical exit with my pride now fully restored. That's not what happened. I was devastated, and obviously, I had some work to do. Pick myself up, dust myself off, and keep moving. People say that when you get to a certain age, you start to mellow, and that as your bones start to calcify, you have to slow down. I don't know what the hell these people are talking about. <laughs> I'm now in, the, in my life in act three. I am so engaged in this, the third act of my life, that every day is a new adventure. Mellowing, what's that? I have tried meditating, but every time I do, I think of all the things I need to do. <laughs> I have been so busy. What a year this has been, and fortunate. I mean, look what's happened to me in the last year. Jane the Virgin, an independent movie, Remember Me, a movie, the Kennedy Center Honors, performing with Pink Martini, an album produced by Emilio Estefan and distributed by Sony, Rita Moreno, it's called, and coming soon to a Netflix near you, One Day at a Time, a series produced by Norman Lear. And finally, finally, <laughs> as I approach the prime of my life, I find I have the time of my life, learning to explore at my leisure every single pleasure. And so I happily concede, this is all I ask. This is all I need. Listen, I don't worry about my bones calcifying. I figure if I keep my spirit in shape, the bones will take care of themselves. It's all part of the Puerto Rican world view. And let the music play as long as there's a song to sing. And I will be younger than Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Wow. Woo. Oh, wow. Thank you. So, somebody is going to win this. Can you see West Side Story? And I'm going to sign it for you. And that person is Dolly. No, no, that's not the. That's, that's the name of the center. I need a person. I need a girl, <laughs> a wonderful girl. Ah. Lee, Woodham. Lee Woodham, director, are you here? Lee Woodham. No? Okay, we'll send it to Lee Woodham. So I'm going to sign, okay? In the back. See you there. You were marvelous. Oh, God. Can we have another round of applause for the fabulous Rita Moreno? Thank you. And I want to thank David Bellinson Management for making this possible as well. Let's thank him. And the books are in the back room. It's $20. $20, and the proceeds go to the food bank. So please head to the back if you like your book. Thank you. Thank you all. This conference is now ended.